Father, we come today and thank you for allowing us to come into your house and to worship together. We just ask you today, Father, to be with us today and just open us up to uh, receive your word, to help us to receive what you have for us today, Father. Open our hearts and our minds today, Father, and just uh, help us to remove any distractions, any hindrances, anything that would detract from uh, your word reaching our heart today. Be with the many that are sick today, Father, and touch their bodies and just help them. Guide us as we go about, and we thank you today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy. victory while we walk the pilgrim's pathway clouds will overspread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not a sigh when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be serving every day just one glimpse of him in glory will the toys of life repay when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be whole soon the pearly gates will open he shall trim the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory Jesus, I shall 
shall see And I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, glorious day The dreams of my childhood have all fallen through. I guess I built my castle on the sand. But every dream in Jesus has come true. Because solid rock I'll stand and I've never been disappointed in Jesus doubt has never crossed my mind for in him no fault I find I've been discouraged Forsaken by all my friends, but I've never been disappointed in Him. I've been given many things. Had them taken all away, but the gift of God is still mine today. Men will give their words, but they won't follow through. I found every promise in His word. Jesus, doubt has never crossed my mind, for in him no fault I find. I've been discouraged with all my family, forsaken by all my friends, but I've never been disappointed in him. And 
Some may even teach at a college You know they say that man evolved all along But what they say it doesn't matter And it doesn't change the fact that I see And if they'd only ask me I'd tell them just what I believe There's a great big God up in heaven And he knows everything that I need He knows just how we're living Oh, he's the only Bible that some people read His ears are always open to his children And he always sends a light I can see There's a great big God up in heaven And I know he's watching over me Onward 
to the Christ before us. Soon his beauty will be home. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Everybody, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. We'll sing and shout the victory. see the sun rise in the morning when I feel the wind blow across my face when I hear the sound of children playing I know it's all part of God's amazing grace. And I believe there's a place called heaven. And I believe in a place called Calvary. In a man whose name is Jesus, yes I do, and I believe that he gave his life for me. I was there. When my mother went to heaven, I held her hand as she closed her eyes to sleep. I felt the power of 10,000 angels take her soul away. And be crowned at Jesus' feet. And I believe there's a place called heaven. And I believe in a place called Calvary. In a man whose name is Jesus And I believe That he gave his life for me And I believe In a man whose name is Jesus And I believe that he gave his life for me. Yes, I believe that he gave his life for me. Start turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We are going to finish up Matthew chapter 7 sometime today. 
It's not going to be this morning, and probably, hopefully tonight, we're going to finish it up. Um, but we are going to be looking at verses 13 through 29, um, and we're going to get oh, about two-thirds of the way through, hopefully, this morning. Um, and then we're going to f- kind of finish up with the last part of that tonight. And um, as you're kind of looking there, you'll know that we've been in uh, Matthew chapter 7 for probably a couple of weeks now, and we're looking at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we're looking at some of the different aspects now. A lot of the different uh, scholars and things say that the sermon actually ended in verse 12, and um, from 13 through the rest of the chapter, Jesus is just kind of going through and really telling them how to apply what he's been teaching them. Uh, you know, I kind of look at it a little bit differently. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a scholar, so um, I'm, maybe I'm wrong about it. But I think that any time that Jesus is talking, he's, he's preaching to them and he's telling them. And when he's done talking is when he's done preaching. That's kind of the way, way I take it. But, um, you know, like I said, I'm not a scholar. I'm just a little old preacher. So um, who knows um, if I'm right or wrong. I really don't care if I'm right or wrong because God's the one that's got to be right, not me. So, um, but we're going to be in Matthew chapter seven again, and uh, and I tell you what, it's a it's been a busy week for everybody, hasn't it? Amen. 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 Thanksgiving, and it looks uh, it looks like everybody survived Thanksgiving. Uh, nobody's stomach blew up, and it looks like everybody. Uh, survived Black Friday. Nobody's got any black eyes or anything. So um, so it looks like you all made it. So that's good. We made it through another another one. And, and we're about to begin another week. So, um, but when we're looking at this, I'm, what I'm going to go through is we're going to start looking at the narrow way and then we're going st- to look at bearing fruit and then we're also going to look at probably tonight the whole subject of building a house. And all this is in this portion of Matthew chapter 7 and when you look at it on the surface, it really doesn't look like they really, they really have a lot to do with, with each other or that they have a lot to do with all the things that Jesus has been talking about up to this point. But he's going to tie them together and what he's trying to get the people to realize and what really um, I think he wants us to realize is how we're going to apply all the things that we've been talking about for the past few weeks and all the things that he's been talking about with the people that he's given this sermon to in, uh, to begin with because um, I can stand up here and I can talk all day long, I can preach all day long, but if you don't know how to use it each and every day, then what good is it? It's just a bunch of words, isn't it? And and it's the same thing here. And Jesus knows He has to give these people something tangible, something that they can say, oh, this is what He meant. And they they can use what He's actually telling them. And that's really what He's going to get into with this portion here. And um, and it's a long portion of Scripture. I'm going to read through the whole thing um, this morning. So um, as I'm reading, just keep your seats because uh, there's quite a bit here. But this is what it says here. It's starting in verse 13 in Matthew chapter 7. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. He says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ferocious wolves. He says, By their fruit you will recognize them. That sound familiar? We've been here before. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do not do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. You notice the tree bears fruit. It's just a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit, rotten fruit. And he says in verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruits you will recognize them. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers or you sinners. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. He says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It says, And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at His teachings, because He taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Father, we come and I thank you again for this uh, time of singing that we've had, this time of worship. I ask you now, Father, to continue to open us up to receive your word today. Help me, Father, to, to be obedient to you, to say what you would have me to say and to do what you would have me to do. Take away any fear, any anxiety that any of us would have in this place so that we can be responsive to the Holy Spirit. I thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, all right. So now, I do want to back up just a little bit and talk about the very last thing we talked about last Sunday night because it's going to kind of set the tone for, which, for where we're going today. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus says this. He says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And we know this as what? Anybody wait? Probably not. We know this as the golden what? All right, now we're all on the same page. All right, and that, the main point that I wanted everybody to get from last week was that we should be treating people as we would like to be treated. We, how we want to be treated. Not how they treat us, but how we would like to be treated by other people. And, and that, and, you know, that's very important for what we just went on this past week with all the Thanksgiving, Black Friday, everybody wanting to kill each other over a crock pot or something like that. And, and we should be treating people how we want them to treat us, how we want to be treated. And that's, you know, and, and, that, and Jesus says, you know, this sums up the whole law and the prophets. He said, this sums up His great commandment, which is to love God with all of our heart or mind or soul, to love others as ourselves. He's saying this kind of sums all this up, and, and it's really the whole meaning behind it. So it, Jesus has them, and he wants them to kind of think about their lives. He wants them to start thinking about how they've been treating other people, and he wants to start thinking about the examples that the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the teachers of the law had been setting for them. And what he's doing here, he's starting to draw kind of a line in the sand between just the normal everyday people and these Pharisees and these Sadducees and this is one reason they were so angry at Jesus. If we go back and we look at verse 20 of chapter 5 again, it says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And we, we talked about that. But a major part of this righteousness and that surpassing that righteousness had to do with how they were treating other people, how they were responding to other people. You know, they, they, And Jesus is basically telling them, you need to be treated people better than these Pharisees and these Sadducees were. You need to be doing things a little bit differently and, and not to be doing that things. And, and we want to look at it we want to look at it kind of like in today's terms these Pharisees and these Sadducees can be a representation of the people of the world. Think about it, just the normal everyday people of the world. And what Jesus is telling them, if you're going to be my follower you should be treating people better than everybody else in the world. And we should be treating people better than the rest of the world treats people. You all agree with that? Amen. All right, just making sure. Because we sometimes tend to have the same mentality as the rest of the world and tend to say, well, they did it to me, I'm going to do it to them. They, oh, they did me wrong, so I'm going to do them wrong. I'm going to get them. Or they ain't going to get my crock pot. This is what Jesus says back in Matthew chapter 5 again. This is verse 38. It says, You have heard it was said, Eye for eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Oh, it's hard. Isn't it? I mean, we're just, let's just be real. And it says, If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Whew, I hope nobody ever forces me to walk a mile with him. <laughs> he says, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, 
Love, uh, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Think about that. So, let's just kind of put it in practical terms here. Meaning that that person that cut in front of you on Friday and got that last crock pot, just let them have it. Not don't let them just have it, let them have the crock pot. You know, don't punch them in the nose, don't give them dirty looks, don't cut them off with your shopping cart, don't do all the things that the people of the world would, would do. And here's something else. Won't you pray for them? Here's something else. Won't you pray that God will soften your heart a little bit? Pray that God will work on your heart. Maybe that God will open your eyes so that you can see them a little bit differently. Treat them the way that you want to be treated. If you want to really be safe about things, treat them better than what you would want to be treated. Let there be no question in anybody's mind whose kingdom you represent and who you represent. We've got to think about that. Because Jesus here, He's going to use this and He's going to kind of transition into telling these people some things about His kingdom and telling them some things about how you get into His kingdom and how you know that you're a part of His kingdom. And he starts out here, I'm going to read it again, verses 13 and 14. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is a great gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. There's nothing magical, nothing philosophical, nothing, you know, oh, I have a hard time understanding that about this. Jesus is telling them the plain truth of what it's going to take to get to heaven. If we want to think about it in 2017 terms, you can kind of think about it in terms of roads and highways. You know, the way to heaven could be described as maybe a one-lane road. Sometimes it's gravel, sometimes it's dirt, sometimes it may be paved, sometimes it's going to be smooth, sometimes it's going to be curvy, sometimes it's going to be full of potholes. It's not an easy way. It's a narrow way. He says only a few people are going to find it. Now the way of the world or the way that many go, it'd be like an eight-lane interstate highway. One way, straight, all the way. And a lot of people, they'll get on this road and they'll be driving down this road thinking, oh, everybody else is going down this road, so I'm going to go too, so it's, it must be right. But they never reach their destination. They get hung up in traffic somewhere. A big traffic jam. They never reach where they're going. Because instead of listening to, to God, listening to people who tell them, you, hey, you need to take the narrow way. You need to take this way over here. They say, no, I'm going to go the way everybody else is going to go. I'm going to do what everybody else is going to do. I'm going to go that way. And I'm going to get there quicker than you are. It's going to be easier for me than it is for you. They never reach the destination. That's what Jesus... I mean, that's really what He's saying here. They're not willing to take a chance. Because on the narrow way, there's not a bunch of signs telling us what's up ahead. Rest stop ahead. Restaurant ahead. Gasoline ahead. On Walmart ahead. You got to kind of find your way. See, we've got a guide if we want to take the guide. But Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find that. So what I want you to think about, this is the first point I want you to think about is are you trying to take the easy path, the easy way, go the way that everybody else is going? Or are you listening to God and going down God's path, going God's way, going the way that God has told you to go? Are you ignoring that for what everybody else is saying? Are you willing to take the chance to go and to follow God and to go down God's path? Are you willing to say that? And you know, you may say, oh, it's too hard, I can't do that. No, you can't. You're right, you can't do that. 
on your own. Well, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. You've heard these before. This is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or the NIV puts it, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. In Deuteronomy 31, this is verse 6. I love this verse. It, Moses, he tell, he's giving them what God tells him to tell them. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And that's repeated in Hebrews as well. It's just a quote. God is not going to leave you kind of out there on your own trying to find your way in the dark with no headlights. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to direct you. But are you willing to go where He's telling you to go? Are you willing to go where He's leading you? Are you willing to walk down the path that He's sending you down? Are you going to ignore it? And just go the way that everybody else is going? The way that everybody else is doing it? Because that's easier. And if everybody else is doing it, it can't be wrong, can it? Was they... uh, Oh, my mom used to tell me, if, if everybody else is going to jump off the building, you're going to go with them? And we probably all heard that. Well, probably, to be honest with you, because if they didn't die, I'd probably be, okay, I'm going to try it too. Yeah, check it out, see what happens, see if I can fly. They, didn't, they couldn't fly, I'm going to see if I can. But it's that same mentality. Guess what? The world is not right about everything. The world's got a lot of things backwards. We better be listening to God and not listening to the world and all the things of the world. We've got to put our filter on and hear God speaking and not the world speaking. Now, why do people go this way? Why do they end up down this old highway, this, this big, nice, fancy interstate? Well, one reason are false prophets. This is verse 15. Jesus says this. He says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And you see, oh, they lie. Oh, they will lie to your face. Oh, they'll make it look so nice and so pretty. Doll it all up. Give it an appearance of religion. Give it an appearance of this or an appearance of that. Make it all so pretty. It's a bunch of lies. It's just a bunch of lies. And they're good at it. I mean, they're good. They were good in Jesus' day and they're good today. I don't know how many millions or billions they've led astray, but just think about that. That's why we have to be careful. That's why we have to be in tune. That's why we have to know what God's Word says. That's why we have to study it. That's why we have to look at it. That's why we don't just dust it off every Sunday or every two or three Sundays. We read it. We learn it. We study it. We know it. That way when somebody's lying to us, we'll know that they're lying to us. We'll know what they're saying. We'll understand. Say, no, that's not right. That's not what God's Word says. If you, do, if you have no relationship with God then you can't know what the truth is. But he says, watch out for them. How do you know? How do you know if they're for real or not for real? So like I said, some of them are good. Some of them can really fool you. Jesus tells us how to know. He says this starting in verse 16. By their fruit you will recognize them. He's, then he says, Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. He says that twice. If you think if he says it twice, it's, it, it's probably important. So you know them by the type of fruit that they're bearing. And it's not the type of fruit that the world thinks is important. Because in the world's eyes, if you got money, if you got power, if you got stuff, if you got things, you must be doing pretty good. That must be some good fruit you're bearing. No, that's just a bunch of stuff that you've accumulated. It's all it is. What kind of fruit are we bearing for God's kingdom? 
You see, we, we look at uh, the rich and the powerful and people that has a lot of stuff and we thought, oh man, I'd like to be like them. Well, I'm going to tell you, some of the most evil and perverse people in the world are also some of the richest people in the world. Because they're putting their faith in their things and not in God. They're, they're in that I'm going to save myself mentality. And if we go chasing after those things, we're going to go far as far away from God as we can ever get. So you better be careful with what you're looking after and what you're looking up to. It's really what kind of fruit are you bearing for God's kingdom? If we want to talk about rich people, well, how are you investing what God has given you? How are you giving what God has blessed you with? Are you glorifying God or are you glorifying yourself? Now... 99% of us don't, aren't rich. But it still applies to us. Good fruit applies to us as well. Because what are we doing with what God has given us with? The talent that God has given us. The skills, the abilities. The calling that God has put on us. The resources that God has given us. How are we using that for God's kingdom? Or are we? That's, what it, that's the fruit that he's talking about there. What are we doing with it? What fruit are we bearing? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it rotten? Is it all dried up? And this is how you know. Because you can come in here and you can fool every single person in this room. You can You can put on the church act. You want to know what kind of fruit you're bearing? Ask the people who you're around outside of church. Ask your children. Ask your spouse. People that you don't put the church act on in front of. What kind of fruit are you bearing in front of them? That'll tell you whether your fruit's rotten or not. Because you're here what? Two, three, maybe four hours a week. You're around them people a whole lot more. And you'll let your guard down. And you'll be yourself. Yeah, I wish, I honestly wish, when people come to church, they would just be themselves. We can make a lot more progress if everybody would just be themselves. They wouldn't put on the act. Good, bad, and ugly. Now, it may get interesting at times if everybody was themselves. <laughs> And that may be something dangerous to propose, but we'd be a whole lot better off if we were all honest with ourselves, if we were honest with each other, and if we were honest with God. Because God can work with that. But as long as we keep lying to ourselves and lying to everybody else, we've got these false pretenses. You know, we can put on the act, we can say all the right things, do all the right things, but if it's not for real, what good is it? So what kind of fruit? That's the second one. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Is what he says in verse 20. By their fruit you'll recognize them. But then he's, he goes on. He's going to talk about something else here. It ties into this because um, I'm sure this is probably what came to the people's mind or this is what one of them may have asked him. So, well, Jesus, but wait a minute. You've got all these people. They're doing these good things. They're prophesying. They're casting out devils. They're healing people. Isn't that, isn't that worth anything? Are all these good works that we're doing, isn't that worth anything? Well, he answers that question too. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he, here's the key, who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Are you in God's will? He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And it all boils down to what our motives is. What is our motivation behind what we do? Are we motivated by love of God and love for other people? Or are we just going to play the part? Follow the rules. Say the right things. But there's no heart in it. So we, gotta, we really need to 
Look at our motivation. Is it for real or is it just a big scam trying to fool everybody? Trying to fool ourselves. Trying to fool the people sitting on the left and the right of you. Trying to fool your pastor. It don't matter if you fool all of us. Because you can't fool God. And deep down, you know what type of relationship you have for God or with God. What type of love you have for God. You know whether it's real or not. Remove the noise of the world and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. That's what's important. Because all the good works in the world ain't going to do it. Last two little passages here. You all know these. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For His grace you have been saved through faith, and, not, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works that no one can boast. Then Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart you believe and are justified, and with your mouth you confess and are saved. That's what's going to save us. You can rack up all the good deeds in the world. But if you've never given your heart to Jesus... It's not going to matter. If you strayed from God, those deeds aren't going to matter. If you are trying to convince yourself that God's going to overlook the fact that you've never given your heart to Him, but how many good things you do, you're mistaken. You need to come to Jesus. Because that's what's going to count. Stand with me if you don't care. Y'all care if you feel like singing? You know, I believe that we have people here this morning that need to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never done that. Maybe you've been going down that eight-lane highway knowing that you're going the wrong way and knowing you need a way out of it, a way off of it. You need to find an exit ramp. Well, that exit ramp is this altar of You can come and you can find Jesus here today if you're willing to do that. Maybe you've been pretending and just kind of playing the part. But your fruit are telling a different story. Now, I'm not talking about having a bad day because we all do that. I'm talking about the everyday pattern of your life. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Maybe you've been following all the rules, but it's just been an act. Well, the jig is up because God knows. If the Holy Spirit's put anything on your heart this morning, I would encourage you to come to this altar and pray. Don't be afraid of anybody else around you. Don't be afraid of what people say or think. That's just lies of Satan. Just focus on what the Holy Spirit wants you to do this morning. I'm going to let them sing, and I just want you all to be obedient. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come one more time, and I thank you today and praise you and just give you all glory today. I ask you to continue to be with us and continue to help us as we go about and just guide us, Father, and just help us as we go on our way, Father, and just uh, be with us today, be with us tomorrow, the upcoming days. Just open us up to be a light and a witness to other people for you. We thank you in Jesus' name.